The Peter Schiff Show. I'd like to thank Raycon for supporting the Peter Schiff Show podcast. Get crisp, powerful beats at half the price of other premium audio brands. Raycon's offering you 15% off their products, and here's what you got to do to get it. Just go to buyraycon.com slash gold. Earlier this morning, we got the release of the CPI data for the month of April. Now, normally, there's very little anticipation with respect to this release because, after all, every month it's either 0.1, 0.2. It's really no big deal. Nobody really cares because the series barely moves. Inflation is below 2%, at least the way the government officially measures it with the CPI. Although there was a lot more anticipation with respect to this release than I have seen in the past. There are a lot of people kind of nervous about the number, despite the fact that the consensus forecast was for an increase of just 02 Now, it made no sense that the forecast was so low. Now, there was a range of forecasts, the low end being 0.1 and the upper end being 0.5. But obviously, most of the estimates came in quite a bit below 0.5, which is why the mean consensus number was just 0.2. But it didn't make sense to me that Wall Street would be so sanguine on consumer prices, not only given what's obviously happening, but looking at what's happened to the CPI in the first three months of the year. In the month of January, we were up by 0.3. In the month of February, we were up by 0.4. In the month of March, we were up by 0.6. Clearly a trend developing. Why would anybody expect the next number in that sequential series of months to collapse down to 0.2, which would have been quite a bit lower than the lowest reading of the year that happened all the way back in January. To me, and I said this when I talked about the March number a month ago on my podcast, that I thought the April number was likely to be higher than the March number. And in fact, I was correct. We got the number and it ended up being 0.8, which blew away estimates way above even the highest in the consensus range of 0.5, 0.8. That's one month. This is the biggest monthly gain in the CPI since 1981. And to put 1981 in perspective, that's the year I graduated from high school. I'm 58 years old right now. And the last time there was a month over month increase in the CPI this large, it was 1981. And of course, the CPI was more honest back then because it hadn't been, you know, reconfigured based on the Boskin Commission to understate inflation. So if we were still measuring inflation using the same methodology that was in place when I was in high school, the number would be much higher than 0.8. Now, the key is, though, looking at what's already happened so far this year, if you take the first four months of the year, Consumer prices are already up by 2%. That is the Fed's goal, right? Their target of 2% a year inflation. And we've already hit the entire target in the first one third of the year. Now, if you assume that the rest of the year is identical to the first four months, we just repeat the same numbers for the next two four month periods, inflation for the entire year will come in at 6% which is well above anything that the Fed should be able to consider acceptable when they're claiming with a straight face that their target is for inflation to average 2%. Obviously, nobody believes that we're going to get a repeat of the last four months over the next two four-month periods. But if you look at the numbers, why would you assume that the trend that's already in motion isn't going to stay in motion? If the current trend stays. And every month we get a 0.2% increase, right? We were 0.4 in February, 0.6 in March, 0.8 in April. Maybe May price will rise by a full percent. If we continue this acceleration from now and through the end of the year, 2021, the CPI will increase by better than 20% for the year. Now, I don't think that this 
curve is going to continue to accelerate at the same pace. So I would bet that the CPI is not going to be 20% for 2021, although it is possible. But I do think that we're going to end up north of 10%. So I think we're going to continue to pick up speed when it comes to inflation, albeit it may be at a somewhat slower rate than what we've experienced in the acceleration over the past few months. But I expect many more months throughout the year where we will have monthly increases that are higher than the 0.8% increase that just broke that record all the way back to 1981. Now, of course, a lot of people would expect that when you get inflation numbers that are not only this bad, but this much worse than what had been expected, that you would see a rise in the price of gold and silver. After all, they are the key inflation hedges. And if there's a lot more inflation than investors think, well, you think that they should be buying more gold and silver to hedge the inflation. But again, that is not the way it happened. As soon as these numbers came out, the price of gold got clobbered down about 10 bucks. And as I am recording this podcast, and it's about a quarter to one on the East Coast, gold's down about $17 and silver's down about 46 cents. So why are gold and silver getting clobbered in the face of higher than expected inflation? In fact, it's not just gold and silver, it's the U.S. dollar. The dollar strengthened immediately after these numbers were released. And in fact, the dollar index now is up 0.6 at 90 spot 75. It was getting ready to drop below 90 before these numbers came out. And paradoxically, it was much worse than expected inflation numbers that caused an increase in the dollar's value. Again, inflation by definition is a measurement of the dollar losing purchasing power. So why is news that the dollar is losing purchasing power even faster than we thought? Why is that bullish for the dollar? Why do people want to buy dollars more as they're losing value even faster? You would think that the news that inflation is a lot worse than people thought, meaning the dollar is losing value faster than we thought it would, that it would spark people who are holding on to dollars to want to get rid of them. But again, that is not the way markets are working. And it's not manipulation. A lot of people immediately they see, oh, this proves that gold prices are being manipulated. After all, why is gold going down on news that should make it go up? It must be manipulation. It's not manipulation. It's stupidity. It's the stupidity of the traders because they continue to operate under the false premise that these hotter than expected inflation numbers are going to cause the Fed to raise rates sooner rather than later. So that is what is hurting gold. It is the expectation that we're going to have rate hikes sooner, not later. That is what is helping the dollar expectation of higher interest rates. Plus, also, if the Fed is going to be forced to fight inflation, well, they're going to have to start shrinking their balance sheet. So they're going to have to start tapering and, in fact, maybe even outright liquidating assets from their portfolio. So it is the prospects of tighter monetary policy to fight off an incipient inflation problem that is suppressing gold and supporting the dollar. Now, eventually, these traders are going to have to figure out what should already be obvious, and that's that the Fed is not going to fight inflation because even if it tried, it couldn't do it, which is why it won't, which is why I've been saying there will be no fight. The Fed is going to surrender. Inflation is going to win by default, and inflation is going to be much worse than the markets expect. Even if we just repeat what we had in the first four months of the year for the next two four-month periods, and inflation as measured by the CPI is only 6% in 2021, there is no way the Fed is going to get ahead of that inflation curve once it's so far behind. Because if inflation is 6% in 2021, it's going to be much higher than 6% in 2022. The only way the Fed will prevent that from happening would be to get out in front of a 6% CPI, which means interest rates have to go to 8% or 10%. That is impossible, so it's not going to happen. In fact, the Fed is going to be creating more inflation as inflation numbers get worse because as inflation 
pushes up the cost of living, that's going to restrain the economy. The economy is going to end up moving into recession because of the increase in inflation and the Fed is going to ignore the inflation problem as it tries to tackle the problems in the economy and in rising unemployment, which is ultimately going to happen as a result of increases in inflation because it is going to depress real consumer spending because the prices of all the things that consumers want to buy are going to be going way up. And of course, a lot of the stuff that they want to buy, they're not even going to be able to buy it because it's not even going to be there because we're going to have widespread shortages, not only because of production bottlenecks, but because consumers who can read the writing on the wall that the Fed is blind to, consumers are going to start stocking up on stuff. So the minute you see something on a shelf that you know you're going to need in the foreseeable future, you're not going to wait until you need it when it may not be available and it's going to cost a lot more money. You're going to buy it right now. So this inflation mindset is going to set in long before the Fed acknowledges that the problem isn't transitory. So from my perspective, though, any weakness in gold should be bought if the weakness is a result of higher than expected inflation. Because inflation is good news for gold. The bad news for the economy is that the Fed can't do anything about it. In fact, the Fed is deliberately creating inflation because inflation is the only policy option that it thinks is politically viable. So when traders figure this out, gold is going to be bought on bad inflation numbers, not sold. But in the meantime, the selling will be muted because the real money understands what's going on and they're buying. It's just a lot of these futures traders that still don't get it. But the real physical market is tightening as higher inflation is going to push more people into gold and silver. Of course, the reaction in the stock market makes a lot more sense. Stocks continue to sell off particularly the technology stocks in the NASDAQ. NASDAQ's down about 2.5% as I am recording this podcast. Interestingly enough, you know, the tech stocks are down a lot more than the gold stocks. The GDX is down 1.4% and the GDXJ is down about 2% as I speak. So technology stocks getting hit harder uh, than these gold stocks. And while the gold stocks are a buy, these tech stocks are still a sell. In fact, we were down, I think, All four days last week, with the exception of Friday. But we were down, I think, for the third week in a row in the NASDAQ. The rotation continues beneath the surface out of these momentum-type stocks into value stocks. In fact, the Dow Jones Industrial Average on Monday actually made a new all-time record high, even as the NASDAQ was down better than 2% while it did it. In fact, the NASDAQ closed that day down about 2.5%. But the Dow was over 35,000 for the first time ever. It was up close to 300 points. And then it tanked near the end of the day, I think pulled lower by the weakness in the NASDAQ. And it ended up dropping nearly 350 points. It closed down about 35 points on the day after setting a record high and being up close to 300 points. But then the Dow got killed again yesterday and it's selling off hard again today following these stronger than expected inflation numbers. And now after being above 35,000 on Monday, we're well below 34,000. As I'm recording this, the Dow was down just under 500 points, about 33,750-ish. And I think, again, headed lower. As I've been saying, we are going to have a pullback in the stock market, particularly in these high momentum stocks that are going to be hurt by higher inflation and rising rates. And speaking about interest rates, yields are backing up. And of course, that's what's also scaring the gold market. The yield on the U.S. 10-year treasury up at one spot, 684. This is the highest we've been since I think early April. I think we're going to hit a new high for the year, maybe by next week, even sooner maybe on the 30-year, which is just below 2.4, two spot 395. The highest it's been this year is two spot 505. 
And I think we're going to take that high out pretty soon. But again, the increase in interest rates ultimately is going to cause the Federal Reserve to increase the size of its asset purchase program. It is going to be forced to buy more treasuries as yields are rising to prevent the yields from rising even faster. And as more people begin to accept and understand how bad the inflation problem is, a lot of people who have been holding on to U.S. Treasuries are going to want to dump them. And given the fact that the official inflation rate is well above the nominal yield on Treasuries, the only one dumb enough to buy it will be the Fed because the Fed doesn't care because it doesn't really cost the Fed any money because it prints the money to buy the bonds. But the problem is, as it prints money to buy treasuries, it destroys the value of the money that they're printing, which means it also destroys the value of the treasuries because all the treasuries are are future promises to pay U.S. dollars, which are being debased to artificially suppress rates. Actually, checking out the tail of the tape on the April CPI, take a look at the year-over-year number. The prior number was up 2.6%. And the consensus was for an increase to 3.6%. That would have been bad enough, except the actual number we got was 4.2%. That is the biggest year-over-year increase in the CPI since 2008. Although that record is likely to fall as soon as we get the May number. Looking at X Food and Energy, the month-over-month increase stripping out food and energy was supposed to be 03 and that was going to match the 0.3 from the prior month. Instead, the actual number was three times as high, 0.9% increase in the so-called core rate, which actually exceeds the 0.8% of the headline rate. Then if you strip out food and energy and look at the year-over-year gain in the core, prior month was up one6 The expectation was April would be up 2.3 year over year. Actually, it came out at 3% even. Core CPI year over year, 3%, already 50% higher than the Fed's supposed 2% target. We also got some other inflation numbers that came out today. We got the Atlanta Fed Business Inflation's Expectation number, and that was at 2.5% last month. They revised that up to 26 And now the number's at 2.8. So even Atlanta Fed, their own survey shows that expectations for inflation now are at 2.8. Again, we're much closer to 3% than the official 2% target. And of course, in the months ahead, we're going to start to put a lot of distance between 3% and where the expectation is going to be because prices are going to continue to rise. In fact, look what's happening. Oil prices today are back above 66 dollars a barrel so even as stock prices are getting killed oil prices continue to go up oil stocks are some of the only stocks in the u.s market that are trading higher today although looking on my screen there is a lot of green when it comes to global stocks we continue to not only see a rotation out of growth and into value but out of u.s names into foreign names which is exactly the type of rotation that i have been anticipating for years and that i have positioned myself and my clients to benefit from and while i'm talking about gas prices i also want to talk about what's been going on with the shortage of gasoline in many u.s states because of a cyber attack on Colonial Pipeline. There was like a ransomware blackmail thing. It shut down the pipeline. And of course, that backed up distribution of gasoline. And of course, one of the problems is a lot of these gas stations, it's not like they're sitting on a whole bunch of inventory, right? They they expect to have their inventories constantly replenished. Nobody's really stockpiling a bunch of gasoline. And so if something happens to disrupt the new deliveries, well, they're all starting to run out. And that's what's going on. And you're looking at, on the internet, you can see pictures of these long gas lines, you know, reminiscent of the 1970s. I read articles where people are waiting online for four to five hours to get gasoline. Now, this is going to be happening, I think, not just with gasoline. I think it's going to be happening with all sorts of products going forward as more and more supply just isn't there and we have constant demand based on printing press money but you know it's interesting the main reason that people are waiting so long is because once again the local governments are out there 
threatening to punish any gas stations for gouging. And even though prices have moved up somewhat, they're not going up enough, obviously, because people are waiting online for five hours. But if these local politicians didn't grandstand and allowed gas stations to charge any price that the market would bear, people wouldn't be waiting online because prices would go up to the point that there wouldn't be a line. Yes, they'd be a lot more expensive, but that is the way the market would solve the problem of a gas shortage. Because if gas stations were allowed to charge a price that actually reflected true supply and demand, what would happen? Well, number one, people that don't really need the gas wouldn't go out and buy it, right? Right now, you probably have people, they're unemployed, they're sitting at home, they're going to get gas anyway, even though they don't need it because they're worried that it won't be there, they just want to get some gas. Well, if you let the price go up, a lot of these marginal buyers who don't really need gas will decide to wait. It's too expensive. I don't really need it right now. Uh, I'll wait you know, until there's no longer a shortage. That means the people who really need the gas for whatever reason, they'll end up paying more, but they're not going to have to wait in a four or five hour line. Also, if you let the price go way up, what that's going to do is bring in additional supply from neighboring states because now all of a sudden, hey, we can get a lot of gas if we bring it into uh, these other states because the price is so much higher. But if you don't let the price go way up, well, then you're not going to be able to recoup the costs to have people taking gas from one state and shipping it into another state. So what ends up happening is because the politicians want to pretend that they care about the consumers, We don't have any alleviation of the shortage. The shortage continues. And also, if gas stations knew that, hey, if there ever was a shortage, they could charge whatever the market would bear, that might lead more gas stations to have bigger tanks where they can keep emergency gas just in case. So if there is a shortage, you know, they could make some good money selling the gas that they stocked up on at a much higher price. But if they can't do that, well, then it's not going to offset the cost of storing all the gas so they don't do it. And so governments with these type of policies end up making all the problems worse. Now, I know a lot of people will say, well, Peter, if they just let the price go way up, well, only the rich people will get gas. Look, the rich people get gas right now. You know how they do it? They pay poor people to wait in line for them. That's what ends up happening. You say, hey, you know, here's my car. Go wait in a four or five hour line and get me gas. And so they still end up paying more and they end up getting the gas because they can hire somebody to wait in line. And so now the person who makes the money is the guy that's filling up somebody else's tank instead of the gas station that should be making the money. You have somebody in between that ends up making the money. But it's all about politicians. It's form over substance. Oh, it's terrible. How dare this gas station charge higher prices for gas and take advantage of the situation? They're not taking advantage of the situation. I mean, the market is working. And yes, let's let the gas stations make more money when the price of gas goes up. I mean, what's terrible about that? In the meantime, the high gas price is going to bring in more supply. It's going to reduce demand and prices will ultimately be lower and you're not going to have these long lines. And what is the value of that? What is the cost of that? If you actually have to wait in line four or five hours to get your gas, what is your time worth? You know, if you just paid more for the gas, but you could just go right up to the pump, fill up and leave. Even if you're paying twice as much, it's actually a better bargain if you figure out what your time is worth. You know, whether it's for work or play, a lot of us are back on the move again this summer. And that's why I've teamed up with Raycon and continue to recommend their wireless earbuds. And again, you can get 15% off your entire Raycon order at buyraycon.com slash gold. So whether you're listening to the Peter Schiff Show or just some of your favorite tunes, a pair of Raycon wireless earbuds in your ear can make all the difference. You get crisp, powerful beats at half the price of other premium audio brands. Raycons look great and they feel even better. They come in a range of colors and with customizable gel tips included for a comfortable in-ear fit. And Raycons are built to go wherever you do with quick and seamless Bluetooth pairing and a compact charging case. In fact, it's so easy to pair, even my seven-year-old Preston has no problem doing it, which is why I always have to fight him when I want those earbuds. Because if I don't know where they are, they're up in his room. 
and Raycon earbuds have a 24-hour battery life. That means they're ready to go when you need them. I like to wear them when I'm walking around here on some of the trails or on the beach here in Puerto Rico. It's beautiful scenery, and what complements the scenery is to have some beautiful music playing in your ears. Again, Raycon is offering 15% off all their products for my listeners, and here's all you've got to do to get the deal. Just go to buyraycon.com gold. There you'll get 15% off your entire Raycon order. In fact, this is such a good deal, you'll want to grab a pair and a spare. That's 15% off at buyraycon.com slash gold. We got another piece of economic data that came out on Tuesday. That's the JOLTS report. And this report shows you how many unfilled job openings there are every month. And it exploded higher. The previous month was initially reported at 7.367 million jobs, and that got revised up to 7.526 million. The consensus was for 7.455 million for March. Instead, we exploded to 8.123 million. These are unfilled jobs. You have all these companies out there trying to hire people, and nobody is taking the jobs. Now, One reason could be that they're not qualified, right? You have all these employers trying to hire people for certain skills and our labor force just lacks the skills that employers need. And while that is certainly true to an extent, the bigger reason why so many jobs are unfilled is because the people don't want them. The people who are unemployed don't want to go to work because the government is paying them more money not to work. So they're not idiots. They're taking advantage of the opportunity to enjoy a paid vacation. And now, especially with the summer coming around, a lot of people are vaccinated. Things are starting to open up. Who the hell wants to go to work now? I mean, this is when you really want to enjoy your paid vacation. So it's going to be increasingly more difficult for employers to hire people. And in fact, I was listening to some of these liberal commentators, these you know so-called economists from the left, and they're just real propaganda uh, guys. But they're trying to talk about how the fact that the government is giving people these generous unemployment benefits, even if it means that people aren't just taking the first lousy job uh, that they get offered, that it's somehow better for the economy. These guys are saying that the ability to pass on jobs that aren't quite perfect, right? They're not really what you're looking for. They're not the best fit. The fact that you have the luxury, thanks to the government, of waiting for the perfect job, that somehow this is going to be better for the economy, because that means that employees will be better matched to their jobs. And so why should somebody take a job where they're overqualified? Why not just wait until they get the ideal dream job and then, you know, they'll take that one. But in the meantime, they don't have to resort to taking a crappy job. They'll just take these government checks. And that if we didn't have all these unemployment benefits, people might have to take the first job that comes around, which is exactly what you're supposed to do. This is a bunch of nonsense. When you are unemployed, you take Take any job you can get. That is the deal. Now, it doesn't mean that you're stuck in that job. Just because you take a crappy job because you need to put food on the table, you need to pay the rent, that doesn't mean that you're married to that job for the rest of your life. You look for a better job while you're working the crappy job, and that's how it's supposed to work. That's how it has historically worked. And you know what? It's actually easier to get a job when you have a job. Right, You look a lot better to a potential employer when you're applying for a job and you're already employed. Right, You haven't been fired. Uh, you haven't been just sitting on your butt for months and months. You're out there working. And personally, I think it shows a lot of character when people are willing to take jobs that are beneath them. I mean, who wants to hire a prima donna? You know, you're out of work. You need money. And so you start working at McDonald's. I don't care if you're overqualified. The fact that you're willing to wait tables or ring a cash register, I like that quality. I mean, bosses want to know that when they hire people, that no matter what they have to have them do, they're willing to do it. They're not going to be prima donnas. Oh, I can't do that work. That work is beneath me. You know, no job is beneath anybody when you're unemployed. Forget about the dignity, right? You have to earn a living. 
You shouldn't be able to wait for your ideal dream job. That's a bunch of nonsense. People who are unemployed are not supposed to be picky. Take whatever job you can get for now and then use that as a stepping stone to another job. In fact, you know, one of the things that happens a lot, if you have a job that you're obviously overqualified for and you're doing it well, chances are while you're on that job, especially if you're interacting with the public, let's say you are a waiter, right? And you're, you know, you're waiting on a table and maybe you're waiting on somebody who is an employer and has a job opening. And you know what? They see you waiting a table and they see that you're clearly overqualified. You're doing a great job. Maybe that person offers you a job. I mean, I know this kind of stuff happens all the time. I've seen people who have been hired by people that they met in their jobs, right? And now all of a sudden they get offered a better job. You got to be out there. You're not going to get offered a job by anyone if you're at home unemployed watching Netflix. So take any job you can get. It is not good for the economy that we've disincentivized people from working. In the meantime, even if you have to take a job that's beneath you, society has the benefit of the fact that at least you're doing something rather than sitting on your butt doing nothing. Of course, I haven't had a chance yet to comment on the reaction in the cryptocurrencies to the Elon Musk hosting of Saturday Night Live because I recorded my last podcast on Saturday morning, the day that Elon Musk was going to host. And if you recall what I said on that podcast, I thought it was going to be a buy the rumor, sell the fact. There had been so much hype leading up to the Elon Musk Saturday Night Live hosting that I thought it was going to be a perfect event for traders to sell the news. And that's exactly what they did, especially when it comes to Dogecoin, which was the coin that was the most hyped up because after all, that's Elon Musk's baby. That's the coin that he touts the most. And of course, he did talk about it. It was mentioned several times, including in his opening monologue when he had his mother, Mae Musk, who I've mentioned on this podcast, I happened to have met because she was vacationing here in Puerto Rico and I got to spend some time with her and I thought she was a, a very impressive woman and uh, we had a good conversation. But in that monologue, his mother comes out towards the end and he's going to give her uh, a Mother's Day gift because, of course, Mother's Day was the next day. And she says, well, I hope it's not Dogecoin. And Elon Musk replies, it is, right? That was the first mention. But then, you know, in Weekend Update, uh, he was asked to describe Dogecoin. And at one point, he had to concede that it's a hustle, right? That was basically it. And that's really what started the collapse. Although I think the price of Dogecoin started to sell off almost immediately uh, as Elon Musk took the stage. In other words, they couldn't really wait for anything to be said. I mean, they were so anxious to sell the news that they started selling almost immediately. And I think the price of Dogecoin dropped by about 35% while the show was still going on. So during the span of the 90-minute show, there was a 35% drop, maybe 40%, in Dogecoin. In fact, as I'm recording now, I think it's bounced back off the lows, but the market cap is around uh, 59 billion. And I think it was over 90 billion when I was recording Saturday's show. But it's not just Dogecoin that sold off, other than Ethereum, which continues to make new highs. All the cryptocurrencies were selling off. Bitcoin is about 55,000 and change, 55,200, 55,300. As I am recording this podcast, again, everybody thought that the Elon Musk SNL appearance was going to be a catalyst to you know, expand the audience, right? Get new people into cryptocurrencies. And so all the cryptos were supposed to rise as a result of this additional publicity and all sorts of SNL viewers who maybe weren't into crypto now, you know, buying it because they saw Elon Musk on Saturday Night Live. But instead of that happening, uh, all the cryptos are down. And again, I think cryptocurrencies are trading with these high risk tech stocks. And again, all the people who think, oh, the reason that gold isn't rising because of inflation is because it's no longer an inflation hedge because people are buying Bitcoin instead of gold. Well, if that were true, why aren't they buying Bitcoin today? We got a much bigger than expected inflation number and Bitcoin is down, not up. 
Bitcoin is going down simply because all the other speculative high-risk assets are going down. Bitcoin is going down along with those. I don't think Bitcoin is going down for the same reason that gold is going down. I think it's going down for a different reason because gold and Bitcoin have nothing in common. As much as the crypto people want to market Bitcoin as digital gold, it's not digital anything. It's a digital lottery ticket, except it only pays off if somebody else is dumb enough to buy it from you. But what I thought was really interesting about the whole Elon Musk SNL experience was the way CNBC covered the whole thing. Because they pretty much devoted the entire day of programming on Monday to Elon Musk and Bitcoin. I mean, they, they could not get enough of that story. I mean, they love cryptocurrencies. They love Bitcoin. And they basically were touting it the whole day. They were touting it uh, last week, too, leading up to it. And really, to me, all that proves is that CNBC has a lot more in common with Saturday Night Live than it does with an actual news outlet, because what they're doing is entertainment. What they're doing is comedy. The investment advice that you're likely to get on CNBC is probably as good, maybe even better than the advice that you're going to get if you are a regular listener to CNBC. I mean, I listen to it as a contrarian indicator. I listen to it because I want to know uh, what the investment public is being told. So it's great for me. And of course, I get a lot of material for my podcast by listening to it. In fact, one of the things I noticed is their love affair with Kathy Wood. I mean, she walks on water as far as CNBC is concerned. They talk about her and her, you know, her funds, one in particular, the ARC Innovation Fund, constantly. In fact, she was on the air, I think on Friday, touting the fund because they have to talk about the fund because it's going down. But every time somebody goes on their air, it's why you should buy it. This is a great buying opportunity. And they let her come on talking about how great it is, how how she loves the setup, how high the returns are going to be. In fact, she said, now, if you buy my fund now, I think over the next 10 years, you're going to get a 30% a year compounded return over the next 10 years. Something crazy like that. So she's allowed to go on CNBC and make unchallenged pie-in-the-sky forecasts about 30% of your returns for the next 10 years, and no one says anything. I mean, this is completely laughable. I mean, it's obvious that she has a vested interest in touting her own ETFs, so clearly she's biased, but nobody even points out the absurdity. I mean, if I was on there telling people that gold was going to go up by 30% a year. You don't think they would, be, they would be questioning my objectivity? They would be saying, Peter, you're just saying that because you sell gold. In fact, that's what they used to say before they stopped inviting me on. Anytime they invited me on, they always questioned my objectivity and my sincerity, right? It was always, oh, you're just here to talk your book. But they never say that to Kathy Wood, even though in her case, she's clearly doing that. Now, maybe, again, you know, People have a tendency to buy their own bullshit, right? They get so caught up in it. I actually think that Kathy Wood really believes that, you know, her fund is going to do that well. I think she is so caught up in this bubble and she's been so reinforced by all the accolades and everybody talking about how brilliant she is and how smart she is. It's gone to her head. She thinks she's as brilliant as all the, the press clippings about her brilliance. So she is not objective. She cannot see clearly what is going on, just like you know the type of mentality that people had during the dot-com bubble. So I don't think she's actually lying. I think she actually believes this, and it's very unfortunate, not only for herself, but it's very unfortunate for people who have followed her into these funds, and they've now loaded up. If you look at the stocks that things like the ARK Innovation ETF owns, they have huge positions in these stocks that are just going to crash. And one of the reasons that the stocks that the ARK Innovation ETF owns, one of the reasons they went up so much, right, is because inflows were coming in to the ETF and then they had to use the money to buy up these stocks and bid up their price. So it was a self-fulfilling prophecy as buying from the ARK Innovation Fund pushed up the price of these ARK stocks. Now the returns on the innovation fund look better and that sucked in more money, which caused even more buying, which pushed up the prices even more, which was a magnet for more money. So it all was a virtual cycle until it reverses and then it becomes a vicious cycle. And that's where we are right now. And I keep hearing all these people talking about 
how this is a great buy, right? Oh, the stock almost was $160 a share last month. And now it's at 103. It did get below 100 yesterday. We did get this reversal. Tech stocks got hammered on Tuesday morning and then had a reversal Tuesday type of rally. And a lot of people got excited about that. They should realize that it was just a selling opportunity. That's how bear markets work. They sucker you in with false hope of a rally, right? Just like bull markets climb a wall of worry, bear markets slide a slip of hope. And that's exactly what's happening with this ARK Innovation ETF and all the individual stocks that are uh, inside it. I expect there to be several rallies on the way down, but it is a long way down. So all these people who are talking about why it's such a great buy now, because it used to be 160 and now you can buy it for 103, 160 was ridiculous. 103 is just less ridiculous. The fund is going down. The 52 week low is $54.31. And I bet that before the year is over, that fund takes out that low. So it's going to be making a new 52-week low before the end of this year. And all these people who are averaging down, who think they're getting a good deal, all they're doing is throwing good money after bad. But you know what? CNBC is touting this thing constantly, just like they're touting Bitcoin or Ethereum. But you know what they're not recommending? I watch it. And I make sure they're not talking about international value stocks. They're not talking about the emerging markets. They're not talking about gold stocks. I mean, every once in a while, somebody will mention these stocks. But, you know, that is one of the best indicators out there that we are doing the right thing. Because anything that they're talking about on a regular basis on CNBC, you don't want to own. Why is CNBC talking about something? Because it's already gone way up, right? And so they cover what's already gone up and they don't understand that by the time CNBC is salivating over something that's gone up 10X, it's time to sell it. And so anybody who is watching this network needs to understand that whatever they're trying to get you to buy is what you actually want to sell, assuming you still own it. What you really want to load up on are the things that they're not talking about. Because all the things that CNBC is not talking about now, in a few years, that's all they're going to be talking about. And why will they be talking about these types of stocks in a few years? Because they're going to be so much more expensive than they are now, right? So what you want to do is you want to buy those stocks before CNBC notices it and starts talking about it. And that's what we are doing uh, with our funds and our products. I mean, they'll never talk about uh, the Euro Pacific funds. I mean, maybe at some point they'll have to. I think when all these funds are number one in their category and they're crushing uh, their benchmarks and the U.S. market uh, since inception, I mean, maybe they will at some point, but I still doubt it. But they'll have somebody will come on and start talking about the weakness in the dollar or the strength in commodities and how they played that or how to play those themes in your portfolio. But right now, they're still oblivious to it. They're still trying to pound the table on the leaders of the bubble, thinking that they're great investment values now because they've dipped back from their ridiculous benchmarks that they established during the bubble, thinking that they're buying value, but actually all they're doing is buying an overpriced stock that's less overpriced than it was at its peak, but still way overpriced relative to its actual value and certainly way overpriced relative to where it's going to trade. And finally, I want to point out a couple of YouTube videos that were just posted to my YouTube channel, Shift Report. One of them was a real vision debate that I did, uh, I think it was towards the end of last month, and it was initially behind a paywall. So only Real Vision subscribers were able to see it. And it was originally sold to me as an MMT debate, but it really didn't play out that way. I mean, we discussed MMT a little bit, but we really never got into the type of debate of MMT that I was expecting. In fact, I got into a good debate on MMT with my opponent in this debate in a discussion that we had before the debate. And so I was hoping that maybe we would have been able to cover that ground, but it never really came up. But it was still a very good discussion. And, you know, one point that I want to make after having watched it is I would have liked to have commented on the monopolies because my opponent pointed out that we need government protect us from monopolies like the Sherman Act and the Clayton Act and 
one of the points that he made, the dangers of monopolies, was that if you have a monopoly and then somebody tries to compete with the monopoly, well, the monopolist is just going to slash prices to put this new upstart out of business. And so that's why we have to have regulations because you won't have competition because the monopolist will be able to destroy the competition by pricing his products at a loss. And, you know, I kind of let that slide. I mean, I made my arguments why I think we shouldn't have antitrust legislation and why uh, the only time you really have to worry about monopolies is when the government grants them and the government uses the power of the state to protect the monopolist. The free market is the best uh, solution and the best defense against monopoly. But I didn't address this particular point and I wanted to address it now. Uh, And so if you go back and listen to that podcast, I want you to have this little bit of extra information because this is a classic example that people use to try to justify government limitations to stop monopolies. And it's all wrong. I mean, none of it is viable economically. And here's why. So let's say I have a monopoly and I'm actually charging monopoly profits and I have the entire market to myself. I have 100% of the market and I have this big monopoly profit. Now, some small competitor is like, hey, Peter Schiff is making a killing in this industry. Let's say I'm selling widgets, right? Peter is making a killing on these widgets. You know, we're going to come in and we're going to sell some widgets and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to charge a little bit less and, you know, we're going to start making a dent in this market. So let's say this upstart company comes in and they underprice me, or maybe they're even pricing the same as me, but they're trying to take away my market. And maybe they succeed, they get 1% of the market. Now, what the argument is, is, well, the monopolist is now going to slash prices and start selling at a loss in order to drive this new competitor out of business. But remember, the new competitor is tiny, got 1% of the market. I'm the monopolist. I got 99% of the market. Am I really going to sell at a loss when I'm losing money on 99% of the market, the losses are going to be huge. My losses are going to be much bigger than the losses on my upstart competitor. So am I really going to lose a fortune to try to you know, protect the entire market? No, I'm going to accommodate that guy. I'm going to let him come in. And okay, now I have 99%. Well, you know, I used to have 100%. Now I have 99%. And then eventually somebody else is going to come in or this guy is going to get bigger. It never makes sense for the monopolist to lose a fortune on a huge percentage of the market to put out a competitor who has a tiny percent of the market, especially if that competitor has deep pockets. I mean, if I'm really making a lot of money because I have this huge monopoly, some other company can raise a lot of money you know, on Wall Street and have a big reservoir of cash saying, hey, just in case Peter tries to put us out of business by selling at a loss, we'll match that and we'll eat a loss for a while because we can hold out a lot longer than he can because he's losing money on 99% of the market, whereas we're only losing money on 1% of the market. So he'll go bankrupt before we do. And so the dynamics of it, the reality means that monopolists are not going to predatory price to put people out of business because it hurts themselves more than their professional competitors. And even if they did that, even if they were willing to suffer a big loss to knock out a new competitor, right? The minute they jack the price back up after they put that competitor out of business, well, now comes a new competitor. Are they going to do it all over again? Eventually, they're going to be out of money and go bankrupt. So it doesn't happen. This is all a farce. If you really achieve a monopoly in a free market, it's because you're doing such a great job that nobody can compete with you. You're giving your customers the lowest price and the highest quality. And if that's the case, that's fine. If the market doesn't need more than one supplier, if the public is being served by an individual company, that's fine. But of course, that doesn't happen. You're always going to have multiple businesses competing. It's very rare that you're going to have one company that's able to do the job so well that they own 100% of the market. The only time that happens is when the government grants the monopoly and then uses its power to legally punish anybody who competes with that government granted monopoly. Then the other video that I wanted to point out, I noticed that we never put my Henry Hazlitt lecture on my YouTube channel. And I did this talk back in early 2009, so over 10 years ago. It was early in the 2008 financial crisis. And the interesting thing about that 
talk is it's actually far more relevant today than it was back then. Because if you look at what I was expecting back in early 2009, at that time, I thought the monetary policies of QE1 were going to lead to massive inflation and maybe shortages of goods and government price controls. I thought that was going to happen during the Obama presidency, and it didn't. Now, I think it's going to happen during the Biden presidency. So not when Biden is vice president, but president. But all of the concerns that I had back then about all this money printing and how it was going to impact consumer prices, I think all my concerns were right. I was just concerned too early because we did not see the manifestation that I expected because of the big dollar rally, because so many people around the world believe the Fed. They didn't believe me. They believed the Fed. They believed that these policies were temporary. They believed that they were going to work. They believed that they were going to normalize interest rates. They were going to shrink the balance sheet. The markets believed all this nonsense. And so we were able to kick the can down the road. We delayed the day of reckoning for more than a decade. But here we are now. We are printing even more money than we were printing back then. No chance of ever turning off the spigots. And I think no chance of fooling the world once again that we have the capacity or the ability or the desire to turn them off again. So I think the same type of inflation that I was anticipating when I gave that speech in 2009, we're finally going to see it. It's going to happen during the Biden presidency, probably during the first term. I mean, I doubt he gets the second term, but it's going to happen during this term, but it's going to happen even worse than what I thought was going to happen under Obama because the amount of inflation that has been created, the amount that's already built up in the pipeline is so much greater now than it was then. So when it all comes gushing out, we're going to be dealing with a tidal wave of inflation. And so prices are going to be going up much greater than what I thought back then. And yes, I still believe that the government is going to compound the problems with price controls and we're going to have shortages. We're going to have long lines. We're going to have uh, uh, rolling blackouts. All the things that I was concerned about back then, we're now going to experience. So I think it makes a lot of sense to watch that presentation now. Now, a lot of people, if you look at the comments section, people want to make fun of me because they say, oh, you see, look how wrong he was back in 2009. He's just a broken clock. He's just been saying the same thing over and over again. So you can just ignore what he has to say. Look, the fact that I warned about a problem and the consequences didn't show up as soon as I expected doesn't mean my warning was wrong and doesn't mean that we're not going to get the consequences. And the reason that I've been saying the same thing for all these years is because it's been the same problem. The Fed has been repeating the same mistakes the entire time. So of course I'm criticizing a Fed that is consistently repeating the same mistakes. Just because we haven't experienced the ultimate economic consequences of these mistakes doesn't mean that I've been wrong for having warned about them so often and so consistently over the years. What's more important is if you actually listen to what I said was going to happen during this talk, you can see all this stuff happening now. Most people believe that could never happen. And so being early is not being wrong. Being wrong is what the mainstream is, saying back then that inflation wasn't a concern and repeating the same thing today, that inflation isn't a concern. And remember, the people who are saying not to worry about inflation today told you not to worry about subprime yesterday. The Fed said subprime was contained, and now they say inflation is transitory. I wasn't saying it was contained. I understood the subprime problem when the Fed did not. So I think I've got a much better track record on forecasting the economy than the Fed does and understand the consequences of bubbles and bad monetary policy. So the fact that I was able to see more than a decade in advance what's happening now doesn't mean that you shouldn't follow my advice or think that, hey, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. The fact that I was able to spot these trends so far in advance tells you that I'm right, that I understood the problems and I don't have to wait until their history to forecast them. I'm not a Monday morning quarterback here. I'm making these calls from the field and I'm making the right calls. And I think, again, people who have followed my investment advice and have positioned for high inflation, yes, they didn't see the type of profits that I first thought they were going to get in 2012, 13, 14, 15, 
but we're going to get them in the 2020. So we're going to get the profits, I think, in 2021, 2022, 23, for the remainder of this decade. And I think we're going to end up making a lot more money in the 2020s than we would have made in the teens had this inflation problem blown up sooner rather than later, because had it blown up sooner, it wouldn't have been as bad. But during all the time we kicked the can down the road, all the problems that so concern me are now so much worse. And so I'm even more concerned now than I was then. And it's even more important that you take my advice now than you did then. Obviously, you didn't have to take it then. You could have stayed in the U.S. stock market. But ultimately, you have to reverse course. You've got to get positioned for the stagflationary outcome for the dollar crash because the dollar is now going to crash in a much more spectacular manner than it would have had it crashed earlier. And so the stakes are much higher. Therefore, the benefit of doing it right is much greater. But more importantly, the consequences of getting it wrong are much more severe as well. (music) 